enzymes that keep your blood from clotting, and those enzymes cause you to scratch it, and when it eats, it poops. So when you, you scratch it, you rub the poop from the bug into the bite, and it moves down through the body, and most of the time ends up making a cyst at the atrioventricular node. And what it, it is the leading cause of heart attack under people in people under 50. Uh, so it's got a lot of uh, prob problems. Uh, it can cause inflammation. It forms these pseudocysts that rupture. Um, it messes up phagocytosis. It enters the nerves around the ganglion controlling the heartbeat. And so. 75% uh, of the heart attacks in these countries are caused by Chagas. Um, what do they do about it? Uh, well, one bad thing is every animal can carry it. So just like uh, the other disease, African sleeping sickness, there is a huge reservoir of other animals, so you will never get rid of it unless you eliminate every other animal. The only one that transmits it is this bug, but been known to be transmitted through contaminated blood and contaminated fruit juices and breast milk and it crosses the placenta so it's got a lot of bad things uh, what do they do to prevent the um, this bug from getting and biting people again we have to use education because guess what it's actually fairly easy to prevent getting this even if you're out there playing in the grass and you get bitten, all you have to remember is don't scratch it, wash it with soap and water, and soap and water kills the parasite. So if you wash with soap and water immediately after you feel the itching before you scratch, you can scratch to your heart's content and you won't get the disease. And every year in Brazil, everybody gets a blood test for Chagas, just like when you go to your regular doctor and you say, run the STD panel, make sure I don't have anything. They run Chagas. And whenever you donate blood, they run Chagas. And they run it also in California, because we have so many people that come from there. My roommate's mother died of this, and no one knew it. She immigrated from uh, Peru, and was in her 60s and had an irregular heartbeat and nobody thought of this disease because we don't see it. So she went to Loma Linda and they were putting in a pacemaker when this cyst blew up and she died on the operating table. And it was Chagas that undiagnosed, unknown, no one thought about it because we don't have that disease here. So. Uh, very sad situation. You think they would? They thought it was a tumor. Oh. So, but anyway, um, there is no sexual transmission of this. It's only asexual. Uh, I've told you about that it pass. It can be passed through fruit juice, sugar cane juice, guava juice, crosses the placenta, organ transplant, blood breast milk. Um, the reservoir is in every other animal. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Did you see that? Say what? Yes, it will kill it. But, you know, most people in South America don't pasteurize. All right. Uh, hmm? uh, the life cycle is very simple. Uh, you just, it's an adult and it reproduces in yeah, asexually, so there's not, there's only the two, the carrier and what it does to us. Um, so how are we going to control it? Personal repellents, DEET does repel this. Uh, you know, the one in AWP, D-E-E-T. Blood testing and screening of entire populations. Uh, testing the blood supply. They add insecticides to paints where they paint buildings with it to repel the organism. And uh, just uh, caution people about uh, drinking uh, fruit juices and things that are not pasteurized. 
All right, so that's Shagus, and that brings us to our last three, and that's Lishmania. And Lishmania, oh, it hides the same way as the other one, antigenic variation. Uh, so there are three kinds of Lishmania. Visceral, which is also called Kala Azar, and it's from the Middle East. Then there's Brazilian, because it was brought over here. And then there's Oriental Sore, which is also in the Middle East. Um, Lishmania is the second of our diseases that can cause cancer. And it is biting sand flies that transmit it. And here's the funny thing. The sand flies bite us, but they don't bite us for food. They bite us to get human blood serum or mammal blood serum, which they use to hatch their eggs. Their eggs won't hatch unless they apply mammal blood serum to the bird. Uh, it only has an asexual stage. When the biting sand fly injects the parasite, uh, your macrophage gobble it up, and the macrophage do not digest it. It takes over the macrophage and reproduces inside your own immune system cell, the macrophage. So it affects many different tissues. Um, it, the visceral form, you can take a blood test and there is an easy treatment for it if the blood test comes up positive. It's the reason why anybody that serves in Kuwait, Iraq, or Afghanistan they cannot donate blood for five years after coming back here because they don't know if it has hidden and might show up. It is detectable through a blood test, but if they have been there where these biting sand flies are, uh, then they uh, make sure that they don't have it. And so that's why they ask you, have you ever been or stationed in these areas? Uh, the visceral one, the untreated one, is fatal. The other two are not. So let's talk a little bit about them. Uh, and by the way, it's almost all animals, but it loves its major carrier is dogs. So in the Middle East, you don't see stray dogs. Dogs are tested, treated, and if they are stray, they kill them. So dogs and foxes and wild dogs can carry it. Um, this is a very interesting one. If you've ever looked at people from Afghanistan or uh, from any of that area of the world and you've noticed their skin, a lot of them have something like a big, big scar, bigger than we used to have smallpox scars. And this is oriental sore. The visceral, remember, destroys your internal organs. And they have both varieties throughout the Middle East. They have the oriental sore and the visceral variety. And it's endemic, it's everywhere. Different species of sand flies carry different ones. So the local people noticed that if you got the oriental sore, if you got bitten by a certain species of sand fly and you got this big lesion that would make this big pustule filled thing and it exploded, and gave you sort of a fever in the area for a couple of days and then left a bad scar, you would not get the visceral that's deadly. So it's a homemade vaccine. They actually take their kids when they're young and they wrap them in a blanket and they leave an arm or a thigh open and they lay them next to the sandfly nest and let them get bitten by the variety that carries the oriental sore. They have an ugly scar, but they won't get the visceral that kills you, even if they're bitten by the sand block. So it's a homemade vaccine. So remember, oriental sore, if you get it, and you get the blister, you're immune to it again and the visceral variety. Um, which one's which nest of which? It's by where the, they're located. They, they have an actual, they have a, uh, what would you call it, environmental niche that's very distinctive for the Oriental. Now, the one that came to Brazil is a beach. Anyone ever been to Florida after sundown? It is not fun. 
go, you know, how they, there's two things that they, there's a lot of things the movies lie to you about. One is sex on the beach. Don't do it. <laughs> All those wonderful romantic things, kiss, hug, have sex on the beach, don't do it. Sand gets in places that you have no idea exist, and for weeks afterwards, you can barely walk. All right? It is not pretty. And the other thing they tell you is it's wonderful to go camping on the beach. Don't go all camping on the beach in Florida. Holy mackerel, as soon as the sun goes down, the no see hits you. It's like a wall of biting insects about half the size of a mosquito. Screens can't keep them out. They are biting sand flies. They do not carry parasites in uh, Florida, but if you ever go there, you know what being bitten by sandflies feels like because you, you can't see them. That's why they call them no see them. And guess what? None of the personal repellents keep them away. The only thing that keeps them away is Avon Skin So Soft. People buy that just to go camping in Florida on the beach because it repels them, but nothing else does. So anyway, in Brazil, these are beach sandflies and they bite you and but it, it doesn't kill you, but it eats away your soft tissue so that you have no nose, or you have no soft palate, or you have no ears. So while it doesn't kill you, you're not going to get many dates without a nose. <laughs> it's not. It's really rough on the people. So uh, the Brazilian variety, remember, is not fatal, only the visceral variety. And there is no homemade vaccine for it, so what they're doing is they're cleaning up the sand flies, and they've almost eliminated it. It's really now only in Surin... What's the name of that country? It used to be Dutch, Guiana. Surin... Surin... Yeah. You know where they... Where that guy killed all those people from San Francisco. Um, so they are getting rid of it. It's asexual, remember? No divinity stage. So the adult is the damaging one, the adult parasite, and can't think of anything else about it other than saying, how are we going to control it? They have developed some uh, repellents. Uh, they have sand fly nets to put over beds at night, and you're not ever really going to get rid of it because so many animals carry it, other animals in the environment. The only animal that gets sick, though, is us. All right, and it hides in the immune system, the macrophage. So that's the end of the parasites. I decided to leave off. You can read about dengue fever. It's re-emerging. All you have to know is it's a viral disease. It's carried by biting mosquitoes of a certain kind called Aegis aegypti, and it kills uh, about uh, 1,500 people a year in South America, and it has now moved into the Caribbean, Mexico, uh, Louisiana, and uh, uh, Florida. And so it is called break bone fever because you get a very high fever and it feels like somebody is breaking your bones. And so what you do is you take basically this, what's that, um, Tylenol plus codone, codeine, and you live through it. Tylenol 3, isn't that what they call it? Yeah, you go to bed, you get bitten by the mosquito, you go to bed, and you just go through this three-day hell thinking you're going to die, and they just basically give you pain relievers to get you through it, and then you're immune to it, if you live. Do you have to write a card on this? No. Okay. No, I'm not, it was, but I'm not going to, I didn't make it, I already made out the test, I forgot to put it on. Other than knowing it's called break, dengue fever, it's carried by Aegis aegypti, and it's called break bone, and it's re-emerging. That's all you need to know. All right, so that leads us with the last thing. We're going to uh, watch a, a few minutes, but it, we're not going to go past nine. We're going to be out of here by nine. You're going to see everything that I just discussed with you on a video. And hopefully it will mean a little bit more to you. Well, there's actually a good thing. Don't count the two days. I'm just going, what the hell was I? Which one did you miss? I have no idea. You get two of them for Wooster Bancroft. Oh, okay. Alright.
So here we go on this. It's called Conquest of the Parasites. It's extremely good. Quality not so great. It's a little bit uh, old, but it's amazing. There's no more like discovery. Kind of reaction to how could our water 
be the source of this. I mean, nobody believed that it could be water. The shock deepened at the news of the first death, then another. By the time the epidemic played itself out, 200 people were dead from complications from the cryptosporidium parasite. It was difficult for healthy people to recover from the episode, so you can understand what happened to people that didn't have healthy immune systems. They just couldn't shed it. Those who died had compromised immune systems. People with HIV, people already sick, the very old, and the very young. The first three weeks of it uh, were incredibly intense. Media-wise, the public, the AIDS activist community that were marching down through the city of Milwaukee and wanted to know why people that they knew and cared about were dying and what were we doing about it. As I mentioned to you, we didn't have answers. That's a terrible feeling. Parasitism is kind of a lifestyle. And, uh, and a parasite is an organism that lives on or in another organism, which we refer to as the host, and does so either at the detriment of the host or certainly at no benefit of the host. So you can have some parasites that really don't cause a lot of harm, but they certainly aren't beneficial to the host. There are many parasites that actually cause great harm, and in fact, can kill the host. When you look at the human condition, and you say, what is a human being? You could redefine what a human being is in terms of its ability to harbor parasites. Uh, almost all of our internal organs, all of our blood spaces, all of our hollow organs, offers opportunities for organisms to live in them. And uh, when they do, and when they cause us harm, we call those parasites. Parasites are probably the most common agents of human disease on our planet. Uh, I often like to say that if uh, Carl Sagan did not go into astrophysics, but instead chose to launch a career in medicine or biological sciences, he would have had to become a parasitologist. Why? Because this is the only group of organisms where we can really talk about billions and billions of people being infected. Parasites' tenacious behavior toward their human hosts is nothing new. They have been at work since the beginning of life itself. And no matter what form of life has existed on Earth, there has always been parasites. Always. That's the nature of things. So from the very beginning, we assume parasitism. Parasites are very clever, though, um, in the way that they've evolved over time and the mechanisms they've evolved to infect new hosts or move into new areas where they previously hadn't been. Uh, just the, the sheer complexity of some of the life cycles um, that they've developed or have developed over time in their association with animals, it's just amazing. As life progresses and becomes more complex and develops defense mechanisms against those parasites and excludes the common ones, it now has to put up with the highly evolved parasites, which have also evolved along with those highly evolved defense mechanisms for stealth and entry mechanisms and cunning and guile, so to speak. We would give them human characteristics. In fact, in their own way, the physical structure of parasites resembles that of our own. They have a complexity of structure and function uh, that is hard, hard to believe. Uh, most of the parasites I work with have structures that are just like man. They have intestinal systems, they have uh, their own kidneys, they have a complex nervous system. Organisms such as bacteria and viruses also require nourishment and protection from a host for survival. The difference between these microbiological organisms and the classic parasite comes down to size. Usually when we talk about parasites, we talk about either single-celled or larger organisms. We don't talk about smaller uh, organisms, such as uh, viruses for sure, uh, and usually bacteria. Bacteria are usually considered kind of as a separate uh, uh, grouping. Scientists group parasites into three different categories. Parasitologists will think about the organisms that they study, the parasites, along three major lines. These would include simple 
single-celled organisms, classically protozoan organisms, such as organisms that cause African sleeping sickness, plasmodium, which causes malaria, cryptosporidium, which causes cryptosporidiosis, which even despite their tiny size, can still be associated with devastating disease. Then there are larger multicellular organisms, generally referred to as worms. <laughs> the three different kinds of worms that we classify as parasites. We have round worms, uh, like aspers and pinworm. Uh, we have flat worms that are not segmented. Those are the schistosomes. And then finally we have the ones that everybody's familiar with, the tapeworms, or segmented flat worms. And then there is a, a series of organisms that are generally referred to as ectoparasites. Ecto meaning on, so they don't live in the host, they live on the host. Mosquitoes take our blood for egg production. Black flies suck our blood for egg production. We would consider fleas the same thing. All of those are ectoparasites, but they're temporary parasites for the most part. We know of a few that are not so temporary, though. We can talk about head lice, we can talk about pubic lice, and we can talk about body lice. And in those cases, they live on us, and they depend on us, and we are their home. In order for a parasitic infection to take place, the parasites must first gain entry into a suitable host. Since parasites are perceived as being everywhere, some of us think we can even catch them by breathing the air. This is not true. There are really only three different ways we can catch the parasites, the ones that we're discussing. And that is, we can eat them, we can drink water in which they have stages so that we can catch them this way. There's even one we can catch by sexual intercourse. Giardia. But the vast majority of the ones that we're really afraid of the ones that cause the most suffering throughout the world are the ones that are transmitted by arthropod vectors. A vector is generally thought of as an organism that transmits a parasite from one place to another, from one stage of its life cycle to another. But we don't even have to go to the parasites. The parasites will come to us. They have their own transportation system, so to speak. Mosquito vectors are responsible for transmitting some of the most dangerous diseases on Earth. One example is lymphatic filariasis. Lymphatic filariasis, which is also known by its common name elephantiasis, is a vector-borne parasitic disease caused by a roundworm, a nematode. It's a very widespread disease throughout the tropics thought to uh, involve somewhere in the order of 120 million people or so around the world. For most people, a filariasis infection brings about only mild side effects. But when the disease infests the lymphatic system, severe pain and intense suffering result. The lymphatic channels can be in various parts of the body. Classically, it's in the lower extremities. So the adult worms are in the lymphatic channels of the legs. And it impedes the return flow of lymph fluid, causing buildup of lymph fluid and the subsequent swelling and then the fibrotic reaction that the body has over years and then the infections of the skin that are caused by the compromised lymphatic flow that results in the fairly grotesque, classic elephantiasis of the lower extremities. The common underlying result is debility, uh, severe inability to, to perform one's, one's daily routine. The disease is very hard to diagnose in its early stages. One of the, the, the very frustrating things about this, this parasitic infection is that in its early stages, it's, it's clinically very silent. So you can get fairly young children that actually become infected with this parasite. And unless you look in their blood to see the embryonic forms of the parasite, you wouldn't know that they were infected. And then very gradually over years, as they enter puberty and, and, and adult life, they will begin to manifest slight swellings of one leg, or a, a hydrocele or a swelling of the scrotum that just gradually over time gets bigger and bigger inexorably. Once they reach that stage, uh, there's not much that can be done medically to try and cure them of that.
parasites have lived both on and in us since the beginning of man. They have evolved to develop specialized techniques to invade our bodies and evade our defenses. While medical advances have bolstered our ability to detect and treat parasitic infections, the parasites continue their quest for shelter and sustenance within us. One method of infection is through our dietary intake. Imported foods have played a significant part in the increase of parasitic infections in the U.S. Today, after the agricultural revolution, and of course with rapid transit, and with the ability to ship products from one place to the other in less than 18 hours, parasites can come to us now. We don't have to go to them any longer. So this raises the possibility for the spread of parasites in places that they never existed before. Another interesting aspect of the whole phenomenon of foodborne diseases is uh, a parasitic disease called anisakis. It's caused by a fish parasite that is transmitted to humans when they eat sushi, which of course is uncooked fish. And this parasite, which is a normal parasite of fish, can be acquired by humans and it causes a, a local invasion of the gastrointestinal tract that in some cases can mimic stomach disease or appendicitis. In this country, in the United States, we've had a burgeoning sushi industry. Lots of people eat sushi. In fact, I eat sushi. I eat it safely. Why? Because we now know how this parasite is transmitted. All you have to do uh, is it cool it requires the fish. the fish to sit around for Parasites a while. Parasites don't come out. In a non-fresh state. Now you can define that any way you want. But in fact, if you catch a fish and place it on ice, ice. Mm -hmm. this parasite stays in the gut tract of those fish. If on the other hand you catch the fish and it sits on the deck of the boat for a while and warms up, the parasites will then crawl out of the gut tissue into the meat of the fish. Now when you put it on ice, bring it in and make sushi out of that, you have the option at least of, of catching that worm. We've become aware of that. Fish that is served in the sushi parlors of America at least, and I'm sure in Japan as well, is as fresh as the day was caught. But not all foodborne parasitic infections have been conquered. Because of their insatiable appetite for suitable hosts, parasites will always search out new ways of infecting us. Tapeworms are parasitic flatworms that live in the intestine of humans. Most commonly they're acquired through the ingestion of uncooked flesh that has the larval stages of the parasite. And there appears to be a tapeworm that corresponds to each type of major meat. There's one that's the leading cause there's of blindness in Los Angeles. Tinea saginata. There's a fish tapeworm known as Diphilobothrium latum. There's a pork tapeworm named Tinea solium. Tinea solium, the pork tapeworm, has emerged as an important infection not only in many developing countries, but also in the United States as well. The parasite is particularly prevalent in Central America and in Mexico, and now the organism has been imported over the border to the point where it has become a major infection in U.S. cities that are near these countries. So we find high rates of T. solium infection in Los Angeles, and San Diego, and San Antonio, and Tucson, Arizona. Cooked pork or partially the reason this is of important to know is because the larval stages of the pork tapeworm have been linked to an illness in the brain. There is a syndrome associated with tinea solium known as neurocystocercosis that has now become one of the leading causes of epilepsy among children living in these cities in the southwestern United States. The pork tapeworm, the egg, when it's ingested into the human, the larva that emerges from that egg and thinks it's in a pig, the larva will go and insist in various parts of the human anatomy, unfortunately including, and apparently the parasite seems to have a tropism for human neural tissue. So you can get cysts in the brain, you can get cysts in the eyes, you can get cysts in the musculature as well. This disease is called cystocercosis. 
Imported and undercooked food is not the only way we can ingest a parasite. Fresh, clean water can never I be taken for granted. And the water we drink in our homes can be tainted. One of the most common parasites in the United States, besides cryptosporidium, uh, is Giardia lamblia. Giardia lamblia is, is, a, is one of our more uh, photogenic parasites. Uh, the parasitologists love to talk about Giardia because it looks like a little monkey face, or it has a personality, it has a smile, it has a little flagella. People like to talk about it. They don't like to catch it. So where do you catch Giardia? Well, you catch it from drinking contaminated water. By the breakdown of public health practices, which ensures the safety of our drinking water, it's a constant struggle to maintain a filtered water supply for communities that are dependent also, upon these filtered water supplies. In reservoirs, for instance, or natural bodies of water, they have a real problem ensuring the fact that the Giardia landlord doesn't enter their drinking water supply. And any time the filtration system fails, you can get outbreaks of Giardia. It's well known that Giardia cysts can survive chlorination, especially if the chlorination is not being done to adequate levels. So there have been uh, large waterborne outbreaks of giardiasis in the United States associated with either malfunctioning or poorly designed municipal water supplies. The diarrheal disease caused by giardia is somewhat different than the usual diarrheal illness because of where the parasite lives in the human host. And the fact that, in, especially in heavy infections, the parasite actually adheres to the walls of the small intestine. Uh, but generally speaking, it can be treated with antibiotics. Gladwell. While giardiasis may cause us temporary discomfort, waterborne disease in the tropics can bring crushing illness. Who the guinea worm? Guinea worm. Uh, known formally as Dracunculus metanensis, found throughout the tropical world, and is transmitted through ingestion of contaminated water. Here's the water flea, the cold There's spot. a certain organism, a crustacean, in, that grows in fresh water that serves as the intermediate host for the disease. And when humans ingest water that has an infected cyclops, which is the name of the intermediate host, they will acquire this disease. It's a worm that's about uh, twice the length of a yardstick in some cases. It lives in your subcutaneous tissues and it seeks out the lowest part of your body. And there, the head of the worm elicits a blister. It's a visible blister. You can actually see the head of this worm under the blister. When you step in the water, the blister bursts open, releasing the larvae that the worm has produced into the water column. And then you get to see this ugly, disfiguring blister on the end of your foot, which you now have to do something about. And in most countries, what you do is you grab a small stick and the head of the worm, wrap the head of the worm around the stick, and slowly, every day, turn the stick, slowly pulling the worm out from your skin. Yeah. If it should break, what if you can eat it? You will experience the worst <laughs> anaphylactic reaction you can possibly imagine. You'll get a sloughing of skin uh, in the region where the worm is. Uh, it will become secondarily infected with bacteria, and when it heals, you'll have a nasty scar for the rest of your life. Another bloodthirsty parasite that burrows through our skin is the schistosome. The schistosome is endemic in parts of Asia and Africa, and utilizes a snail as an intermediate host before infecting humans. Juvenile schistosomes, called cercaria, emerge from their snail host into fresh water where they swim frantically looking for the only host where they can complete their development, a human. Once the swimming cercaria find human skin, they eject their tail and utilize skin dissolving enzymes to burrow through the skin of the foot and eventually into the bloodstream. One of its remarkable abilities is its capacity to live in what should be the most inhospitable place on earth an individual's bloodstream. These worms actually live in blood vessels. Now think of it. If you are an infectious agent, where's the last place you want to set up there, shop? You? We are being bombarded daily by antibodies, being bombarded daily by white blood cells, and yet here the schistosome not only survives, oh, but it thrives. Once the juveniles have matured, 
the male and females pair up for life where they mate, continuously producing and releasing eggs. No divorce Let's there. the example of the bladder schistosome than the schistosome hematobium. With this type of schistosome, oh, this is female, a male the menstruation. egg has the ability to traverse through the bladder wall. As the egg does this, it elicits a host inflammatory response that's also associated with bleeding. As a result, people who harbor bladder schistosomes develop blood in their urine, a condition known as hematuria. A curious instance where the presence of hematuria caused by bladder schistosomes affected history was when Napoleon entered Egypt. Napoleon's troops, it was prophesied, would be stricken by Pharaoh's curse should they choose to enter into Egypt. And what was Pharaoh's curse? It was male menstruation. And sure enough, when many of his troops came into Egypt, they acquired bladder schistosomiasis. And many of the troops believed that this was the prophecy of Pharaoh's curse fulfilled. Another fascinating parasitic disease is one called onchocerciasis, the common name of which is river blindness. This is a parasitic disease caused by a roundworm parasite of man that in its clinical end stages causes a very devastating and irreversible blinding disease. It's a parasite that is transmitted from human to human by the bite of a black fly, which is the vector. The black fly breeds in fast flowing streams and therefore the disease is most endemic in the valleys of these streams and thus the name river blindness. After the vector bites a human, it deposits the larval worms which invade the skin and eventually end up forming a nodule under the skin where the adult worms develop. While they're in this fibrous nodule under the skin, the adult worms shed on the order of three to five thousand microfilarii or larval worms per day per adult. These larval worms, instead of entering the bloodstream, remain in the subcutaneous tissue and migrate through the subcutaneous tissue, causing changes to the That's skin that, that can manifest in such ways as uh, very hypoelastic skin, baggy skin. As the disease progresses and the number of larval worms in the subcutaneous tissue increase, they eventually gain access to the tissues of the eye and cause microcalcifications, which over time build up and cause the blindness. This is where they slit my throat and had some sort of plastic tube. The IV side went bad here and they cut it out and then um, left me with a scar. And I also have the scar for my feeling too. I, my body is scarred now. 34-year-old Haslin Bostwick is a native of South America who lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Haslin knows a lot about one particular parasite, Plasmodium falciparum. It is the most deadly of all parasites, and more commonly known as malaria. I go into the interior of Ghana very often. I used to spend up to 10 days in there at a time. And in order to make sure that I don't come into contact, if does anything nothing bites me, was I would make sure that my tent was sprayed before I go to bed at night. While I'm outdoor, I make sure that my body is totally covered so nothing could bite me. In the spring of 1999, Haslin had her blood checked for malaria when she returned from a trip to oversee a gold mine she owns in Guyana. She wasn't feeling well, but her tests proved negative. So Haslin took her son on a school trip to Washington, D.C. She became weaker, more nauseous. Three days into the trip, Aslan took to her bed. So I lied down and then I got up, later on, went to the bathroom and went back to bed. And when I went back to bed, I never got back up again. 
Aslan Boswick slipped into a coma. She was taken over by the malaria parasites. Aslan joined the ranks of 250 million victims around the globe who contract malaria each year. Three million of those people die, and it's the young who suffer the most. Every 30 seconds of every hour of every day, the malaria parasite kills a child. The research done over even the last 50 years have not been able to reduce the mortality, the in-hospital fatality rate of severe malaria in children in the tropics, in primary care hospitals in the tropics, 1%. Nothing that we've done has been able to reduce the mortality of severe malaria. Malaria had been a mystery for centuries. No one knew exactly where it came from, nor how it was passed from victim to victim. The evil illness seemed simply to emerge from the stale air around swamps. In fact, the literal translation of malaria is bad air. In 1880, a protozoan parasite was found living in the blood of malaria patients. The female Anopheles mosquito was soon identified as the vector for the malaria parasite. Sixty years later, malaria was still the leading cause of sickness and death in humans on Earth. The medicine quinine made from the bark of the Sincona tree, had been used to ease symptoms for 400 years. But it took until the 1950s to find hope in a weapon that would wipe out malaria's carrier. Chlorinated hydrocarbon insecticide, DDT. There was nothing quite like it before, and there has been nothing like it since. Here was a chemical that could be sprayed on the walls of a house and for up to six months, any insect that rested on that surface would die. It was then thought to be non-toxic to humans, and it was inexpensive to manufacture. The female Anopheles mosquito was public enemy number one, and world health officials had a brand new weapon. Eradication efforts were effective in North America and Europe, but after a decade of trying to annihilate the mosquito in Africa, India, and Asia, the success of DDT slowed. War, corruption, inaction, famine, and a host of other problems detracted from the battle against malaria. By the late 1970s, the World Health Organization bitterly admitted that malaria was back and worse than ever. Today, only the HIV virus comes close to the destruction malaria brings upon this earth. It's estimated by some economists that malaria alone reduces the gross domestic product of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa by about 1%, perhaps even more. That translates into billions of dollars of loss in those countries every year. So it has an enormous impact in every military campaign in which U.S. forces have been involved in the last hundred years where malaria was transmitted, we've always had more casualties to malaria than we've had from hostile fire. That means, from a military perspective, that malaria has tremendous mission aborting potential. The swamps around Haslan Bostwick's South American gold mine were a perfect breeding ground for the Anopheles mosquito. As the mosquito fed on Haslan's blood in its nightly ritual, it released thousands of thread-like malaria parasites that were stored in its salivary glands. For 12 days, Haslin would go without symptoms while parasites invaded her liver and transformed into organisms that moved on to her red blood cells. The tiny creatures divided and multiplied by the millions. They became so numerous that her red blood cells exploded. By the time Haslin fell into a coma, Parasites were shutting down most of her vital organs, including her brain. The only organ that was functioning was my heart. Everything else had already shut down. By the time I got to the hospital. Remember, it's marazoa, it's blocking They have to, put pretty much, they have to put catheters and whatever else they have to put in me. 
Dr. Stephen Hoffman was rushed in to work with Haslam. So what was going on was these parasites were binding to these small blood vessels in her brain and blocking up blood flow. If there's no blood flow, then no oxygen gets to your brain and you slip into a coma. After centuries of suffering and death, decades after the discovery that malaria is a parasite and research into a cure, there is still no effective modern drug to combat malaria in its late stages. And there is no practical vaccine against malaria. We're in a situation where the two major drugs in this world used for treating severe malaria, cerebral malaria, severe malarial anemia, um, hyperparasitemia, high levels of parasites in the bloodstream, are quinine and artemisinin derivatives. Both of those have been available for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's not that we haven't developed new drugs for treating the parasite, but that the parasite has either developed resistance to those drugs, or they're actually not as good as these age-old remedies. Through the developed world's best medical efforts, Haslin did stabilize, and miraculously, she survived. After five weeks of devastating illness, Haslin responded to treatment and has been malaria-free ever since. This, this particular parasite kills, and not too many people can survive to tell a story. Because especially getting to the point where I was, because I shouldn't be dead. I should not be here sitting with talking to you today. I should really be dead. Efforts to eradicate and treat the terrifying destruction of parasites all over the world meet with varied and intermittent success. In the case of vector-borne parasites, African governments have attempted to eliminate the vectors, the flies and mosquitoes and other insects that carry parasites for river blindness, elephantiasis, and malaria. These efforts have slowed the spread of some infections, but many scientists argue that eradication of parasites may not be possible. We've actually never been able to control, to the point of extinction, any parasitic infection. The only uh, disease-producing agent we've ever been able to get rid of is smallpox. And that's because smallpox only infected the human and no other host. Some of these parasites can infect multiple hosts. You can have reservoirs out there. So even if you could infect cures in people, you still couldn't get rid of it in animal populations that might also harbor the same stages. So even if you could control everything in the human population, you could still reintroduce it every now and then because of these animal reservoirs. If eradication isn't an option, then controlling the spread of infection is the answer to limiting parasitic outbreaks. One control success story is the Onchocerciasis control program. When Onchocerciasis was at its height, in the late 60s and early 70s, it became evident that this disease was a major impediment to successful development, particularly of these countries in West Africa where it was so highly endemic. Because of that, the World Bank, the WHO, and other international organizations banded together to form the Onkosa Crisis Control Program, which has, in its 25 years of existence, had a major impact on blocking the transmission of the disease, protecting the vision of over 600,000 Africans in West Africa, and allowing somewhere in the order of 15 million children in this area to be able to grow up without the threat of blinding on surprise. The guinea worm story is uh, one of our shining lights in terms of parasite controls. Uh, it's found throughout the tropics, throughout Africa, throughout the Middle East, throughout India, uh, and even in South America as well. It's an intermediate host, that is, it lives in other things besides humans. It lives in the same water fleet. And by filtering out the water fleet, you can get the other guinea worm. See, Mr. We taught people how to do that, filters. they went and did it, and we've controlled this infection now in all the 13 countries throughout the world. It used to be in hundreds of countries. 
In the developed world, new water treatment practices have been developed to keep out cryptosporidium parasites. Milwaukee spent $80 million building a new water plant. But the tragedy in Milwaukee brought attention to the daily efforts being made on the part of water treatment officials to ensure that our drinking water remains safe. The lessons that we learned in Milwaukee is you need to be prepared, you need to know the capabilities and the vulnerabilities of your water treatment system. One can never say this will happen again, but one can never say it won't. And so until there's assurance between the health department, the water officials, and others, then you're as prepared as you can be. You're at risk. David Leidy of the American Red Cross believes the Milwaukee outbreak was a wake-up call. The sheer size of the incident suggests that there's a potential for this type of thing to occur in the future. I mean, even though our water supply, like our blood supply, is very safe as well, and great measures are taken to prevent these kind of instances or these kind of occurrences from happening. However, it just points out the fact that parasites can, in fact, be very opportunistic. Uh, and then if there is a possibility of them getting into a system, in this case a water system, uh, which they are allowed an opportunity to grow and develop and to replicate, uh, then they certainly can take advantage of it. Some see a future in biological controls putting parasites at war with each other. Introduce a benign echinostome flu to the host of a parasite like the schistosome flu in hopes that the benign flu will attack and kill its harmful cousin. The snail is infected with this evil schistosome and along comes this nice echinostome that has a mouth and a gut and it seeks out the schistosome in the snail and whammo, it, it, it sucks it up, it swallows it and the schistosome uh, larval stage is gone uh, and uh, this is a marvelous biological adaptation whereby this tug of war is going on in the snail and the schistosome, uh, this evil schistosome is destroyed by this nice schistosome. The idea of biological control in some respects is, is very attractive um, as opposed to something like DDT which is very harmful to the environment. If you could have a biological control, uh, for instance another animal eating the intermediate host or one of the, the vectors of a, a parasite, um, you know, that's a great idea because that doesn't involve something that generally harms the environment or disrupts the ecology, at least in most cases. Another avenue of protection is the development of a vaccine against parasitic infections. Dr. Stephen Hoffman and his team at the Navy Medical Research Center in Bethesda, Maryland are developing groundbreaking vaccines for malaria. The team begins with thousands of Anopheles mosquitoes from the research centers in Sectory. I would not volunteer for Volunteers are bitten by malaria-infected mosquitoes no. that have been exposed to radiation. The radiation weakens the malaria parasites harbored within the infected mosquitoes. The weakened parasites evoke responses from the volunteers' autoimmune system. After thousands of these responses, the volunteers develop immunity to malaria. While progress towards a workable vaccine is made every day, the complex nature of parasites creates a moving target for medical science. They have multiple antigens or proteins that are expressed on their surface at different courses in their life cycle that makes the design of, of a vaccine almost impossible. The more we learn about these parasites, the more respect we gain for their side of the life cycle. And the more respect we gain for the immense amount of selection those parasites have caused our biology to undergo. The shape of fish is determined by their the ability parasite. of these organisms to infect new hosts and infect virtually every animal that we know. Uh, there's just so many different varieties of parasites and so many complex things that you you can learn as well as simple things. There's nothing easy about studying parasitic organisms. They tend to be very difficult to maintain in the laboratory. It tends to be very difficult to get large numbers of organisms to study. As a result, 
doing biochemistry on these organisms is difficult, doing genetics on these organisms are difficult.